Hello, my name is Matt Alexander and I am the senior pastor here at First Baptist Church in Greenville. We are delighted that you have chosen to join us in worship. Here at First Baptist, we are committed to know the Word of God, grow in the Word of God, and go forth in the Word of God. So as we come together, let's come with hearts prepared to receive the Word that He has for us and to go forth in His presence. May God bless you richly as you worship Him today.
God like Jehovah than he is. There's no God like Jehovah. 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 There's no God. clap along with us. Let's try it. Behold he comes.
what a blessed time of worship we've already had this morning. Uh, thank you, Brother Mickey and choir and all involved, and thank you, Louise, for that beautiful message and song. I think you could sing that every Sunday, and I would be okay with it. I love the love her voice in that, and, and the message of that song is so true and wonderful, great theology for us to sing before the King of Kings. This morning, I ask you to take your Bibles and turn to Mark chapter 11, the first 11 verses. Uh, we've had a wonderful weekend with our youth. In fact, I want to uh, recognize everyone who had a part in this weekend because uh, we as a church need to be thankful of all of our servants who have uh, taken part in making this weekend a wonderful success for our youth and their friends. And so I'm going to ask you if you were involved as a small group leader, a driver, a uh, worker in the kitchen, or helping in any way possible, would you please stand this morning? Amen. Let's thank them. And students, thank you for showing up uh, this weekend and being involved and in, in giving of yourself and time out of uh, your schedules this spring to come and to sit before the Lord. We had a wonderful weekend uh, beginning Friday night, uh, all day yesterday in, in worship. We had a, um, Red Taylor from Cleveland and, and his band led us in worship and Justin Shipley from um, uh, First Baptist Ruston. Uh, taught this weekend on Friday night and two times yesterday and then in their small group time they uh, went through the book of James and with the theme alive and free of what it means to live the gospel what it means to live as a child of God what it means to live in the life that Jesus has given us and the freedom that he's given us Paul says in Galatians 5 1 for freedom Christ has set me free, therefore let's stand and let's not submit again to a yoke of slavery. And so students, thank you for being involved. I want you to know as a church family, we love you. Uh, we are excited about what God has in store for you in the future, and we are praying for you. Uh, I'll say a little bit more about that in a little while. And I want to talk to you this morning as kind of a wrap-up, and then we overflow as a church-wide. We're all involved in this. But I want to talk to you this morning uh, on this Palm Sunday from Mark 11 about worship, about worship, going along with the theme of being alive and free this weekend, going along with the theme of understanding who we are in Christ, who God has made us to be, and how we live, whether we are a child, whether we're a teenager, or whether we're an adult, how we live uh, alive and free in the worship that God has called us to. Because you know that word worship sometimes can uh, carry different meanings for all of us. But as we think about what worship really is, I think the entrance of Jesus into Jerusalem on Palm Sunday reveals to us the true nature of worship. And I want to I just give you a simple definition of what worship really is. Worship is our lifelong commitment to understand how to uh, appreciate and how to respond, how to enjoy the God who delights over us. That's what worship is. Worship is not just gathered to this hour on Sunday morning or your time together as a youth group on Wednesday nights. Worship is a lifestyle. Paul says it is the life we live. We're not tr uh, conformed to this world, but we're transformed by the renewing of our minds. In worship, is simply a lifelong commitment of learning how to enjoy the God who delights over us. And that's what I want you to know today, that God delights over you. Sometimes as human beings, we forget that. We can get bogged down in life. We can get discouraged by our own sin, our own struggles. And know that God delights over you. He created you. He loves you. He has a plan and purpose for you. And, uh, and you know what my prayer for you as a youth group has been this weekend? The psalmist says that we are to taste and see that the Lord is good. 
You had a lot of good food this weekend. We're thankful for the, the good cooks and those who went and, and brought food for us and the food that you enjoyed, that wonderful candy bar that you had uh, every night to pick and choose of some sweetness. Uh, and, you know, that, there was a plan and purpose in that. It was not just for you to enjoy some fun things, but as you taste that favorite candy that you had out there, you could pick and choose a lot of different things. Uh, and that's good. You taste that, and it's good. It might be your favorite. Well, the Bible says that we are to taste and see that the Lord is good. All of us. We are to taste and see daily that the Lord is good. That's how we worship God, that we learn to enjoy God because He delights over us. And there are so many ways that we can enjoy God. We can enjoy God through our favorite worship songs, we can enjoy God through ways that He's gifted us to serve Him. You can enjoy God through your favorite sports as you do that to bring honor and glory to God by the way you carry yourself, the way you live, the way you act. Our life is to be uh, a, a sacrifice given unto enjoying God. And Jesus said in, in the Gospel of John that true worshipers worship in spirit and truth. And so as we enjoy God, we, we do it in spirit, meaning that as a Christian we have the Holy Spirit within us. And so worship is a spiritual exercise, but it must always be centered on the truth of God's Word and the truth of who God is. And so as we think about that this morning, I want us to look from Mark chapter 11, from the life of Jesus as He enters Jerusalem, about to go through the Passion Week as Good Friday and Easter Sunday approaches. Jesus enters Jerusalem and he's going to show us, and the crowds around him are going to show us several things about how we worship God, how we taste and see that the Lord is good, how we learn to enjoy the God who delights over us, and how we uh, live our life worshiping God in spirit and truth. Several practical things I want to share with each of us this morning about what this passage shows us about worship. Look with me in Mark chapter 11, beginning in verse 1. It says, As they approached Jerusalem at Bethpage and Bethany near the Mount of Olives, he sent two of his disciples and said to them, Go into the village opposite you, and immediately as you enter it, you will find a colt tied there on which no one has ever sat. Untie it and bring it here. If anyone says to you, Why are you doing this? You say, The Lord has need of it. And immediately he will send it back here. They went away and found a colt tied at the door outside the street, and they untied it. Some of the bystanders were saying to them, What are you doing untying the colt? They spoke to them just as Jesus had told them, and they gave them permission. They brought the colt to Jesus and put their coats on it, and he sat on it. And many spread their coats in the road, and others spread leafy branches in which they had cut from the fields. Those who went in front and those who followed were shouting, Hosanna! Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. Blessed is the coming kingdom of our father David. Hosanna in the highest! And Jesus entered Jerusalem and came into the temple, and after looking around at everything, he left for Bethany with the twelve, since it was already late. What does Jesus show us about right worship? How we worship in spirit and truth, how we taste and see that God is good, how we live each day enjoying the God who delights over us. Well, the first thing this passage shows us about why we are to worship God is because Jesus is in control. Jesus is in control. In verses 1 through 3, uh, uh, Mark is telling us that Jesus has his disciples and they're journeying. Um, they, they've been in the region of Beth, uh, Bethany. They're going into Jerusalem because Jerusalem is where Jesus would spend the final hours of his life. It's where he would be crucified. It's where he would uh, rise from the dead. It's where all of the final events of his life would take place. So a very holy time in the life of Jesus and Jesus' ministry. And they're entering Jerusalem and Jesus tells his disciples a very specific task that they are to do. And it's a very strange task if you were those disciples in that day, and even for us reading it today. The task he tells them is not to go preach to a group of people. The task he tells them to do is not to go and, and serve their community. 
The task he tells them to do is not to go and, and do good works in some other region, as they've been doing. Not to go heal a blind person or cause the deaf to hear or bring, uh, bring life to someone who was already dead. And all of these things the, the disciples had already witnessed Jesus doing by his power. But none of that involves the instructions that Jesus gives his disciples. He tells them, go into the village opposite you, and as soon as you arrive, you will find a colt tied there. Literally a, a donkey, but not just any donkey, a baby donkey. <laughs> so a colt is a small animal. We just use that word colt to refer to, you uh, call a, a baby horse a colt, and call a baby donkey a colt. And this was not a seasoned donkey that they were to find. You know, in the first century world, they didn't have cars. They didn't have modern transportation like we had. If they were to travel somewhere, they either walked, went on a donkey, or rode a camel. And so, as uh, they've all throughout their ministry at this point, they've been walking. Everywhere they went, they've been walking. In fact, this is uh, the first time that we see Jesus riding anywhere. We, he may have, we don't know that, but it's the first time in the, in the Gospels that we read of that. Everywhere else, Jesus has walked. And he gives them very specific directions to go and find this colt tied there, and it's going to be a colt that no one has ever ridden. Let's just stop right there and say, have you ever got on a donkey or a horse that has never been ridden before? Anybody done that? <laughs> A few of you? Was it a pleasant experience? <laughs> not quite. It's not a quite exper a pleasant experience. Why? Because a horse, a donkey, doesn't, isn't immediately kind to someone sitting on their back. <laughs> they have to be trained for that. If you like riding horses and you've been Maybe, you know, you can ride horses sometimes in, in the mountains if you've been on a trip or on the beach or maybe just somebody's farm. When you get on a horse and you have a good riding experience, I can guarantee you that horse has been trained. He had someone who knew what they were doing at a certain point in time, and they put a saddle on him. And they put a saddle on him, and they didn't maybe get on that saddle the first time. They put a saddle on him, and they put him in a pen, and they let him run with that saddle. And then they would tighten uh, the saddle a little more and a little more until he got used to it. And then they would gradually get on his back. And still, you want a seasoned trainer on his back uh, for the first time someone is riding because he knows how to handle the animal and keep from getting bucked off to the point that he gets injured. Because uh, if you get on an animal that has never been ridden before, you're most likely going to end up on the ground pretty quickly. <laughs> well, Jesus is directing his disciples to this donkey colt, who donkeys uh, are the most stubborn of animals. And he's saying, bring him here. No one has ever ridden him before, but I'm going to get on him and I'm going to ride him into Jerusalem. Now, for anybody else, that would have been a sideshow. <laughs> you could have... Um, probably sold tickets to watch it <laughs> because Jerusalem is packed with people at this point. It's a holy week on the Jewish calendar. People would, uh, pil there would be uh, pilgrimages to Jerusalem to worship because it's Passover week. So lots of people. And here Jesus is going to come down a stone, uh, dirt or stone road into Jerusalem on the back of a baby donkey who has never been ridden before. What does this show us? It shows us that Jesus is in complete control, not just to tell the disciples where to go and what to find, and to say, uh, Jesus had not already gone to the house, by the way, to tell them, my disciples are going to come for your cold. How do we know that? Because Jesus says when you get there, when they ask, what are you doing? You say, the Lord has need of it. They, the, the, the owners of the donkey didn't know Jesus was coming. But Jesus was in control to point them there, and to lead them to the exact place where to find the donkey. Jesus was in control to know that when they told the, the owners of the donkey that the Lord needed it, that they would send it. And Jesus was in control because when he got on the donkey's back, Jesus had a smooth ride into Jerusalem. Even this baby donkey 
submitted to the lordship of Jesus. Do you understand that? Do you see that? That even this untrained cult of a donkey knew the man who's sitting on my back, though I've never had anyone on my back before, is the Lord. Jesus calls himself Lord. Here he says in verse 3, you tell them the Lord has need of it. Why is worship important to us? Why is it important to live our life enjoying God? Why is it important for us to understand what God wants for us and to submit to His good and perfect plan? Because Jesus is in control. He's in control. It may seem like things are out of control in the world. It may seem like things are out of control in your life. And sometimes it may seem like I don't want Him to be in control. Because all of us like to make our own decisions. We like to be in control. And we may think, well, that seems like life is going to be no fun. Well, let me tell you something. We should be glad that Jesus is in control because that means I don't have to be. It doesn't mean I don't get to be. It means I don't have to be. If I'm in control, that means I've got to have a plan for this whole world. And when things mess up in my life, I've got to figure it out. When things mess up in my life, when they don't go the way they should, I've got to come up with a plan. I've got to have all of this known. And yet we can submit to the one uh, in worship who knows uh, long before you were ever created. He knew you. He had a plan and purpose for you. He knows the numbers of hairs on your head. He knows the number of sand on the seashore. He has created this whole world. He's holding it in existence. One day he's coming again to redeem and to call all who believe in him on this earth to be with him for all eternity. You see, we all worship someone or something. Let's worship the one who is in control. The one who even this donkey submitted to and says, I know the Lord is on my back. Real worship knows and lives under the submission and authority of God. Because here's the thing. God loves you. He doesn't want to withhold things from you. He wants to truly give you life. We think life is in this world. Life is in what God has to offer. And living, the more you submit to Him, the more you enjoy Him, and the more you want to submit to Him. We worship because Jesus is in control, but we also worship because Jesus submits to the Word of God. Look with me at verse 4. It says, They went away, and what happened? The disciples found the colt tied at the door outside the street. They found it just as Jesus said. And some of the bystanders were saying, what are you doing untying the colt? And they said uh, that Jesus told them and they gave them permission, just like Jesus said. So they bring the colt to Jesus and put their coats on it and Jesus sits on it. Jesus was in control because Jesus was the Son of God sent from heaven and he, was, uh, he not only submitted to the Word of God, John 1 says he was the Word of God. In the beginning was the Word and the Word was with God and the Word was God. Jesus was the Word of God in flesh. Jesus is God. He's the Son of God. We, uh, the Trinity is God the Father, God the Son, God the Holy Spirit. They're three, but they're one in perfect equality. We don't understand that. Don't ask me to explain it. But we know it to be true because God has shown himself to, to be that way. And if you're a believer, then you have felt the power of the Holy Spirit in you, speaking to you, confirming things in you, encouraging you, convicting you, leading you, and guiding you. But Jesus, in His life, He fully submitted to the Word of God. He was the perfection that we cannot be. You see, the religious people in Jesus' day, they were trying to be good enough to be right with God. They were keeping all the commandments and all the laws of the Old Testament, or they thought they were. They made a system that made themselves look good. And to the point that other people, common people, would come along and they would get the idea that there is no chance that I could ever be right with God because I cannot look like these religious people. And Jesus came along and Jesus had harsh words for the religious people because they were trying to show themselves to be perfect. And Jesus comes to them and he says, if you want to be right with God, you must be perfect as your heavenly Father is perfect. Not as the religious people think they're perfect, but as God definitely is perfect. Well, none of us can do that. So how do we be right with God? Well, we trust in Jesus because Jesus was our perfection 
for us. You see the love of God? God has demands. He has demands uh, that if we're going to spend eternity with Him, certain qualifications must be met. But the problem is you and I cannot meet the qualifications that God sets forth. But the answer is God has given us Jesus who met those qualifications. And as we trust in Jesus, He has fully submitted to the Word of God for us in all of perfection. So as we trust in Him, as we believe in Him to be our Savior and Lord, as we submit to Him, as He submits to the Word of God, guess what? He leads us now to be able to obey God in a way that we never could before. How do we know that Jesus really is the Son of God? Well, that's something that you have to put your faith and trust in for yourself. No one can do it for you. But there are many um, proofs that we have that Jesus really is who he says he was. There are things in the Bible. There are things outside the Bible. that Historical events that point to the truth of Jesus. But there are many prophecies that were given in the Old Testament that talked about Jesus. I want to share one with you right now in Zechariah chapter 9 in verse 9. Listen what it says. Behold, your king is coming to you. He is just and endowed with salvation, humble and mounted on a donkey. Who does that sound like? That sounds like this passage in Mark 11. And it would be good even if it stopped there, but it doesn't stop there. Listen to what it says. Even on a colt, the foal of a donkey. These things just didn't happen. You see, in the Old Testament, when Zechariah said this, they thought he was crazy. Because no king ever rides into town on a donkey, (laughs) let alone the cult of a donkey. You just don't do that. If you're royalty, you don't pick a donkey to enter town on. And when Jesus comes again, he's not going to be on a donkey. This time he's going to be on a white horse, the Bible says. Because he's already paid for sin and he's been victorious. But Zechariah, hundreds of years before Jesus came... Uh, prophetically spoke exactly how Jesus would enter Jerusalem, and it is exactly how Jesus entered Jerusalem. He is the king. He, he was the king then. He's still the king now. He enters Jerusalem on a donkey, on the cult of a donkey, to show his humility, to show his lordship, to show his fulfillment that he was submitting to the word of God exactly as God laid it forth. There are thousands of other prophecies in God's word that speak to Jesus in this way. It's not something that can be made up. Jesus was and is the real deal. He submitted to God's word 100% so that you and I could put faith and trust in him and be right with God. Jesus met the sacrifice for you and I so that we would not have to. He loves us. He he has great plans for us. And as you trust in Him, as you submit to Him, He will lead you in submission to the Word of God. That's how we delight in the Lord. That's how we learn to enjoy the God who delights over us. We all worship someone or something. And in the world we live in, it's getting even easier to worship other things but God. But there's only one object of worship that can truly meet our needs and that can truly lead us to life because Jesus said himself I am the life we worship him because he's in control we worship him because he submits to God's word but we also worship him because of his humility look with me at verse um, verses 7 and 8 It says they brought the colt to Jesus, and he gets on it, he rides on it, and uh, many people spread their coats on the road and leafy branches. This is why we call it Palm Sunday, because they're waving palm branches as Jesus enters that they had cut from the fields. And this is an act of humbly entering Jerusalem. This man who is declared king, this man who is supposed to be nobility, this man who is supposed to save Israel. And and this is what you thought in the first century as Jesus declared himself king. If you were a Jewish person, you thought that Jesus was coming and he was going to deliver you from the political power of Rome. 
That's why down in verse uh, 9 and 10, they are saying, Hosanna, blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. Do you know what that word Hosanna means? It's from the Psalms, and it means, save us, we pray. So it is a prayer of salvation. And so all of these people are gathered in Jerusalem, and they are uh, paying homage to Jesus, the king, as he enters Jerusalem on a donkey, on the colt of a donkey, and they're saying, Hosanna, king. Hosanna, save us. Well, they did not have in mind spiritual salvation. Only Jesus knew what they were declaring by saying Hosanna. You know what they were wanting? They were wanting political salvation from Rome. They were wanting, they were living under the oppression of political power. And that means little to us today. But I'm just showing you that their mindset was all wrong. And Jesus is coming to them, and he, in humility, he's riding on a donkey. As they're declaring Hosanna, he's saying, Oh, I'm going to save you, but I'm going to give you a better salvation than saving you from Rome. If you don't hear anything else I say this morning, can you know that Jesus has come to be your salvation? And it is a better salvation from anything you think you need to be saved from today. Because Jesus came to be our salvation, because He came to deliver us not from political power, not from uh, hard life circumstances, not from uh, hard circumstances at school or at work or anything else in life, because He came to meet our greatest need, which is an eternal separation from God, and that's not God's fault. It's our fault because Adam and Eve took of the sin that uh, God said, do not do. They could enjoy everything else, but it's human nature to want to do the one thing we can't do, and so they did it, and sin entered the world, and you and I have been sinning ever since. And we can't blame Adam and Eve for our sin because we sin on our own. We've just been transmitted the power of sin through the generations. And Jesus saw that our greatest need, that if we do not have a salvation outside of ourselves, we're going to live in our sin, we're going to die in our sin, and we're going to spend an eternity separated from God. And God does not want that. No one wants that. We can't blame God for that because we are the sinners. And God sent us Jesus to be our salvation. And because Jesus has met your greatest need in salvation, He can meet every need in your life that you have under that. It may not be the way you want it to be met. It may not be in the timing you want it to be met. But this I promise you. Read Romans 8. He will meet your need in the most good and most perfect way way. Why? Because He loves you. You are the apple of His eye. He created you. He has a plan for you. He's not going to leave you or forsake you no matter how much you mess up, no matter what other people say about you, no matter what the world says about you. Aren't we thankful that we have a God who does not give up on us? How do we know this? We know it because Jesus entered Jerusalem in humility, and all of the events that are going to follow are going to show us the love of Jesus. Jesus is worthy of worship because he embodies humility. And that's why the Bible says God hates the proud, but he gives grace to the humble. You know when you're most like Jesus? When you humbly love other people. When you don't brag about yourself, you don't think of yourself to be somebody, you don't promote yourself, you just humbly love and serve other people and follow God. Jesus is humility. <clears throat> we worship Jesus, fourthly, because Jesus alone can save, and I've already touched on this. Verses 9 and 10, those who went in front and those who followed were shouting, Hosanna, blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. Blessed is the coming kingdom of our father David. Hosanna in the highest. This again is another prophecy from Psalm 118. Not only are the crowds waving palm branches, but they're shouting Hosanna. They're saying, save us. And Jesus said, I'm going to save you, but I'm going to give you a better salvation than you could ever think of. Hosanna is a cry of salvation. Can I ask you this morning, what is your Hosanna? What do you need to be saved from today? 
Whether you're a youth or an adult in this room, what is your Hosanna? What are you saying, Lord, save me from it? It may be an addiction. It may be a lifestyle. It may be a problem. It may be um, pain in your life. It may be stress or anxiety or worry or whatever it might be. What What is your Hosanna and who are you seeking to answer that call? You see, we can look to many people in life as our quote unquote salvation. If I just had this, I would feel safe. If I just had that, I feel like this problem would go away. If I just could do better, all of this would be gone. All of that is lies from the enemy. It's all lies. The only way that we can find salvation from any problem, any issue that we have in this life is to cry out to Jesus. The one who hears us. And let me tell you something. The one who cares. The one who cares. This world, there's a lot of people in this world saying they care about you. A lot of people. And I don't mean your parents and your family who truly do care about you. I'm talking about all the things that the world is feeding us to promote you or to promote us and say, well, we care about you. We want you to live this way. We want you to do whatever it might be. But all of that's a lie. It's a lie. God cares. He loves. He has a plan for you. And the only one that we need to come to and say, I need salvation. I need answers. Is the one who 2,000 years ago hung on a cross. For me, for you, for the sin of the whole world. And he said, I'm not okay that they die in their sin. I'm not okay that they live their life with these struggles that the world is telling them is right and good, but it's only going to lead them to death. I'm not okay with that. So I'm not going to require them to die on a cross. I'm going to do it for them. You see, that is love. That is love. Anybody that tells you they love you, but they don't act like Jesus towards you, they don't love you, okay? Because the Bible says God is love. And if somebody loves you, they are going to exhibit the character of God to you. Why? Because Jesus, why is Jesus even entering Jerusalem to begin with? He's entering Jerusalem to go to that cross because he loves you. Jesus alone can save. No matter what the world promises, Jesus is our only salvation. He said, I'm the way, the truth, and the life. No one can come to the Father but through me. Have you trusted in him? Do you know that if you were to exit life or Jesus were to come back today and you stood before God, that everything would be okay? I want to tell you something. It's very simple, but it's very profound. All of us in this room are struggling with a lot of things. Life is hard. The day and age in which we live is difficult. It's getting worse. We have our own individual problems and concerns. And you, you're teenagers, but you have your own problems and concerns and things that bother you that you may think nobody else knows about or cares about. It's okay to not be okay. Understand that. If you feel like you're not okay, it's okay. It's okay to not be okay, but it is not okay to stay that way. It's okay In fact, it's needed. It's necessary. We're all not okay. We're all broken. And it's okay because God looks down from heaven and He sees us. The Bible says while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. It's okay to not be okay. But it's not okay to stay that way because if you stay that way, the Bible says the wages of sin is death. And the world will lie to you. People will lie to you all to keep you on that path of death. But God has given you life. And He has been the change agent who enters in when we're not okay. And He changes us. We don't have to change it. The only way we come to God is just as we are in our un-okay way. And God does everything else. Do you need to come to God today? Do you know 
that you're trusting in Jesus as your salvation, if there is even a question, this is the last service of this weekend that we've had together. Don't let it end without knowing that Jesus alone is your salvation. Lastly, we can worship Jesus because Jesus always does what is right. He acts justly. Verse 11 says he gets off the donkey, he goes into the temple, he looks around, and he leaves. The net, we've already looked at the next passage, which tells us the next day Jesus goes into the temple and he turns that place upside down. He was extremely angry. And I think he uh, gave himself a night. I don't think he slept any this night because he was so angry. He goes in the next morning and he turns the temple upside down. <laughs> I wonder what he would have done if he didn't go home that night. We just think Jesus was mad the next day. I think he was, he was sleeping on it a little bit, though I don't think he slept. I think he was letting himself cool down, and the anger that we see the next day is cooled down anger. So that shows you how angry Jesus is with people who fake religion, who fake their way before God. Don't be a fake. Be genuine. Be genuine. Don't try to act like you have it all together. None of us do. Jesus is looking for worshipers who will worship in spirit and truth. That's it. There's no other qualifications. Spirit in that it's spiritually genuine. Truth in that it's based on the Word of God. Apart from that, if it's biblical, it's worship. And that's what we must understand, and that's what we need to get to. And I realize... That for traditions and generations, maybe we've been lied to and maybe we've been lead to think that worship is something else. But all of that is man-made. And Jesus acts justly. He does what is right. He, he gets off the next day. He's going to go into the temple and he's going to cleanse it. This is why. Because Jesus is looking for people who genuinely love him, serve him, and follow him. If it's just going to be a religious ritual, ritual or it's just going to be fake, then he would say to us, you're not ready to follow me. Because I don't want those who are just going through the motions. I want those who are real. And I see a bunch of real people before me. A bunch of people who God has a real and loving plan for. And I'm excited to see what those plans are. But how you respond to Jesus will make all the difference. I don't know what we're dealing with today. I don't know what's in our hearts and minds, what we're going through. I don't know what the Lord is speaking to us, but I know this, that He's speaking to us. And all of us will respond in some way. A lack of response is still a response of saying, no, Lord, I'm not going to come to you. Maybe you're here today or you're under the sound of my voice and you need salvation. You've been crying out to other things to save you. And you know that only Jesus cares about you enough to die on a cross for you and to save you. No one can love you like God can, no matter what the world's telling you. And you need to know today that your salvation is concrete, it's real, not in what you've done, but what, in God, has, but, but what God has done. If you need that today or you're questioning that today, settle it. If you're in this room, I'm going to be down front and would love to receive you. If not, uh, if you're watching online, all you have to do is tell God honestly in your own genuine words that you're a sinner in need of salvation. It's not a special prayer. Sometimes, I, I, you know, I've grown to not even like those repeat after me prayers because that leads people to think if I get one word wrong, God didn't save me. God's not looking for a repeat after me prayer. God is looking for a prayer from the heart. All you have to do is say, Jesus, I'm sorry, I'm a sinner. I want you to save me. I want to submit to your Lordship so that I can be truly alive and free. And He will do that. Maybe you've realized, whether you're a teenager, an adult, or, or an adult in this room, you're a follower of Jesus, but... There's just a lot of stuff you're dealing with. And you've been crying Hosanna to other people, other places. 
But only Jesus can fully reach out His hands today and say, Come to me, all you who are weary and heavy laden, and I will give you rest. He wants to give you rest for your soul today. And we would just come and make this altar a place of prayer. This weekend, as these students arrived, Friday, they were asked to fill out a prayer card at registration. And Friday night and all day yesterday, these prayer cards were in the chapel for you to come and pray over. If you didn't make it, you, you missed a blessing there. We want to, in the next passage that we get to in Mark, which we've already looked at, Jesus overturns the temple and He uh, says, My Father's house shall be called a house of prayer, but you've made it a den of thieves. I, I love that passage because Jesus didn't say, I will, My Father's house will be a house of great preaching. He didn't say it would be a, a, a house of great, uh, beautiful music. He didn't say it would be a house of great attendance. He said, my father's house shall become a house of prayer. And as I look across the landscape of our nation, I see churches in turmoil. I see Christianity in disarray. I see Southern Baptists not even knowing what they believe anymore. And I think it's all because we have left the house of prayer. And we need to get back to it. We can say we believe in prayer all day long, but it's not until we start praying that we see God move. And these prayer cards are down front, and I wonder, student, Miss, maybe you would like to come and kneel, and you don't have to take a prayer card per se, but just kneel as an act of worship and say, I'm praying for my friends, adults in the room. I wonder if you would just come and respond and kneel and pray and say, I'm praying for these students. I'm praying for the next generation. I'm praying for our church, for our move of God to be genuine and real, to worship in spirit and truth and nothing else. So that we together can be alive and free. Would we just let God move and respond to Him in a way that is honest and worshipful? And let God take it from there. Father, thank You so much for loving us. Thank You for dying on the cross for our sins. Thank you for being all that you are to meet all that we are not. Lord, I thank you for these students. I thank you for their families. I thank you for the leaders that we've had this weekend. And God, just for the work you've done. And God, we don't let it end now, even when we depart this service. May it continue. God, I pray as a church we would have a firm commitment to be behind them, to be prayerful over them, to lead them in the truth, even in the hardest situations of life that they're walking through. To say we love you because God loves you and we want to lead you in spirit and truth and we want to lead you to worship the God who delights over you. Lord, would we just enjoy you in this hour? whether it's salvation that's needed, whether we need to come and kneel at this altar and we need to uh, get in the habit of kneeling at this altar and giving everything to you to say, Spirit, take the roof off this place and move in our midst. Lord, that is what we ask. You are King of kings. You are Lord of lords. Now may we bow the knee and submit to you alone in whatever decision you're calling us to. And Jesus, we ask it all and only in your name. Amen. Thank you for joining us in worship today. I pray that God has spoken to your heart through the authority of His Word and the power of His Holy Spirit. We would love to know if we can minister to you in some way or if there's a decision that God has laid on your heart through the message today that we can come alongside side of you and pray with you and help lead you in the next steps. Please contact us by the information there on your screen and one of our staff will, will connect with you in the days ahead and, and come alongside of you and walk you through this journey as we serve the Lord together. May God bless you richly in the days ahead.